Um, I think we're going to wait till 2.05. 2.05, okay, okay. Two more minutes, yeah. Um, okay, so it's 2.05, it's exactly 2.05, so I guess we are all set to go. Um, okay, so as we know, um, good afternoon again to all the participants here. And as we know, this event is the SPE webinar titled Preparation for Postgraduate Studies, Admissions and Scholarships. We will be hosting a couple of our alumni who were members of SPE in the log, are also students of the departments. Okay, so um, without wasting further time, I would like to read out the profiles of our speakers available here. I think they are all on now. Okay, so first up, we have Michael Jacobs, um, bachelor's in petroleum and gas engineering, 2017 sets. And his thesis was supervised by Dr. Ehimo, who was a petrobol participant and the US general secretary for the 2016 stroke 2017 session. He is currently um, running his master's in Stanford University in petroleum engineering. And currently he assumes the post of um, the vice president SPE Stanford chapter. Okay, so our next, the profile of our next speaker or of our other speaker is Judah Odiachi. University of Lagos, Bachelor's in Petroleum and Gas Engineering, 2017 sets. His thesis was supervised by Dr. K.E. Abuliman. He's a Petro Bowl participant of 2017. And currently he's running his master's degree in Petroleum Engineering slash Data Science and Analytics, 2021. And he, he's currently the vice president of the SP regional chapter, I think. I'm not really sure what SPWLA squared means. What? Society of Petrophysicists and Well Log Analysts at okay, the University of Oklahoma. Great, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Then we have the profile of Kartha Babatsunde, University of Lagos as well, also an alumnus of Petroleum and Gas Engineering 2017 sets. Her thesis was also supervised by Dr. A.B. Ehimowo, and she served in capacity as the SP in the lab general secretary 2016 through 2017. She's currently running her master's in University Technology Petronas, UTP, Petroleum Engineering, and she's the head of the and she's the head academic bureau of PSC UTP 2021. Okay. Then our the profile of our of our next speaker is Ahmed Suli. He also ran his bachelor's in petroleum and gas engineering 2017 thesis supervised by the great Dr. Y.B. Adibwe. He's currently running his, his master's in the Institute of Petroleum Studies IPS, which is a joint, I think, center of Unipost and France, and in petroleum engineering and previous developments. And he's the IPS Batch 17 career team lead. Then our last speaker is Abd Hafiz Shitsu. He ran his BSc in petroleum and gas engineering 2017 as well. Thesis was provided by Dr. A. Akinua. And he's running his master's in petroleum engineering and project development in the Institute of Petroleum Studies IPS. And, he's, and he currently is the IPS batch 17 time manager. So without further ado, 
let's welcome our first speaker, uh, Mr. Michael Jacobs, to take the floor. So, Mr. Michael, you're welcome. Um, thank you. Um, my name is Michael Jacob. Um, like Chigo just said, uh, I finished from this department a while ago, and I'm currently um, at Stanford for a master's program. Uh, so without wasting time, I'm just going to say what I think should be running through people's heads while they are trying to apply to grad school. I think before you apply to grad school, you should probably ask and answer these questions for yourself. Um, what programs are you interested in? What schools? Um, why? I think this is the most important question here. Why? Why this program? Why this school? And then what are the requirements for these schools? Because really different schools have different requirements and different programs have different requirements. And then ultimately, how do you fund this? I think these questions, like if you've not already answered these questions, you should be trying to answer them in the nearest, at the earliest possible time, really. Um, Okay, so why grad school? I think there are many different reasons for many different people. Um, the biggest reason that stands out for me is opportunity, right? Um, if you've lived in Nigeria for a long time, you know that this is a very scarce commodity. So people are in search of opportunity. Um, so grad school gives you opportunity, opportunity to further your education, opportunity to explore a different landscape, opportunity to go more than being a local champion, opportunity to um, serving another economy basically and opportunity for a better life um there's other reasons like market value to gain new skills personal ambition family expectation building a legacy and I, I like this one the most a very popular reason for most people for a lot of people now is to just jack out which is also valid i think um so now to fund your grad school i think this is probably the biggest question that's going to be on everybody's mind I think there are three main options to fund your grad school. Um, you could use personal funds. You could use um, government funds in terms of like PCDF or um, scholarships funded by oil companies like um, Shell, Ajip, Total and the likes. Um, they tend to sponsor mainly people from oil producing states, but also some of them have like general scholarship opportunities that you might want to look into. Um, but I think the most important funding source that we'll be talking about today is international sources, money from outside, right? Uh, and this comes in various forms. There are, the most popular ones are research assistantships. Um, and then there are also other scholarships like Rhodes, MasterCard. I've listed some of them here, but there are a lot of scholarships really. But the one that we'll probably mainly focus on today is research assistantship. So let me just spend some time talking about how this works. Um, the model that most Nigerian undergraduates are used to, to for education or tertiary institutions is you pay your school fees to a school, the school gives you admission, you come, you study for a couple of years, pass the exams, get a certificate and you're done, right? The school's major source of income is your school fees that you pay um, and some government um, funds, right? But, and this is also true for many schools around the world. Like for example, most UK schools also use this model, like um, students come, pay some fees, they come, learn, pass some exams and graduate. But a lot of schools at the graduate level, especially in the US, which where I am, the fund, the model is different, right? So the major source of income is not necessarily your school fees, it's research. So companies, governments and organizations um, basically give these schools money and ask them to um, perform some specific research that they're interested in, right? So let's say, for example, let's say Chevron is interested in um, directional drilling, for example, and then Chevron goes to some school, say Stanford, and says, um, I need to find out an optimal way to um, drill horizontal wells in this type of reservoir. And then Stanford conducts that research and finds some interesting results and shares that with Chevron. Chevron applies those results and is able to increase their profits. So that, that's the funding model for top tier graduate schools, right? So the model is your school fees is not the means of the money. The means of the money is research, right? So which is why they look for grad students who can um, come conduct this research under the supervision of the professors and then basically deliver results. And then because of the results, more companies are going to put more funds for research and then the cycle renews itself like that. So that's the main funding model for most grad schools. So if you understand this, it would 
you'd be like it would help you understand how you can fit yourself into this pipeline. So this is not the conventional come to school and read. It's a different scenario entirely. I'll share a graphic about what this looks like um, later in this session. Uh, moving on. Um, so I think the, these are my, what I consider the five main parts of your general parts of your application, right? There's a transcript, which is something you already have. Um, the question that the admission committee is trying to answer by looking at your transcript is, I think it's, can you learn? What's your track record? What have you done in similar courses, right? That's what they're trying to ask themselves and answer from your application. Um, and then there's standardized test scores, GRE, TOEFL, GMAT, IELTS, depending on which schools you're applying to. Different schools have different um, test score requirements. Not test score requirement as in which exams they want to see and not necessarily what grades you get. I'll come back to that. And then the statement of purpose. I think this is probably the most important part of this um, application. Um, this statement of purpose tries to answer the questions like, who are you? Why are you applying to this program or to this school? Um, why should we admit you of all the people who are applying? Like, are you worth the investment? Tell us, basically. Um, letters of recommendation. These are basically someone else's perspective or point of view about you. Um, for this, I recommend that you find people who actually know you, who actually like you. I want to see you win, right? Um, I think for the letters of recommendation, it's what they write is more important than who they are. So the focus is not on getting a high profile person to recommend you. It's more about what's this person gonna write about you. I think that's the more important like, factor. And then you're raising me basically, what have you been up to? Right. Um, I think we'll touch on all of this different parts of the application during this conversation. I'm just trying to go through so that I can direct your thinking and then you can better ask questions. But I think you're going to learn a lot from the five people on this panel. Um, so this application is basically you, right? I have no doubt that you are an awesome person. Like if I get to meet you in person, I have no doubt that you're amazing, you're spectacular, you're worth the investment. But the thing is, it's not scalable for these professors or this admission committee is to meet you in person. If they can meet you in person, I'm sure they, I'm, I'm confident they will give most of your admissions, right? But they cannot meet you in person. So this paper is how they meet you, right? So this is what she's, whatever you write in this five, whatever you submit in these five sections, is how they form a picture of you, right? And uh, we'll talk more about this in a bit. Um, so I think now we should talk actually. So um, I just made that presentation to direct your thinking and to help you ask questions. And then the different people on this panel were going to help you talk through more of this and then answer questions. So um, feel free to type a question in the chat or just unmute yourself and ask a question. Totally fine. Thank you. Okay, um, oh, Michael, um, thank you for that very stimulating um, introduction to this. Well, the thing is, uh, the template that we have for, for discussions and questions, we are kind of trying to leave that to after all the speakers talk. So once we have the rest of our speakers on board and once they are done with their, with their, with their sections, then we can take a lot of questions because we have a bank of questions already. So um, I think we should try to move on to our next speaker, Mr. Judah Odeachi. Um, sorry, oh, Michael, um, did you hear what I said? Yeah, I heard what you said. Um, I'm not sure if, um, Judah, did you intend to give a talk? Um, I did not intend to give like a slide presentation or anything. I thought it would be like, questions and answers and like I mean general discussions as to okay. the application processes. Okay, okay. Um so if that's the case then I think we we have a bank of questions already. So after we ask the bank of questions and everyone contributes then we can we can move on to other questions that will be asked by people who are attending currently. So is that okay? Would it be okay if I just add a few things to what uh, Michael has given us already? Okay, yes, definitely. Definitely. Okay, so um, I think Michael has actually gone through the main things, but I just wanted to add like um, two, three things. Um, for the first time, he talked about um, the goals as well. I know that for a lot of us, um, the goal is not just um, to get a graduate degree. I mean, not everybody's coming back to the classroom or going to do research in actual life, right? So um, for your goals, you have to be, one thing I think is, you, you have to be actually really be honest with yourself. 
And um, even though you want to go to top school and all of those things, some of you might be thinking about, okay, I want to stay in this country after I'm done and all of those things. So you have to put that in mind when uh, selecting your country. And then there's something that Michael mentioned that I kind of do not agree with uh, very well. He talked about um, mm -hmm. uh, your letter of reference that it's not about uh, getting a tall person and everything. Why that is not the primary thing it is, I mean, your, your letter of reference holds more weight if it's an AP or a doctor if, rather than a mister, especially if it's in academics. So, I mean, Michael is right about that not being the main focus, but then if you have a doctor write it for you rather than a mister write it for you, it should be so much better. Just saying. So, um, yeah, and also, yeah, he mentioned something about your transcripts that, uh, yes, uh, the transcript is supposed to tell that, um, can you learn? Also, I think one thing that they also want to see from the transcript is that, what have you learned, actually? They want to see that your background actually matches this program. Because sometimes when you're applying, because you did a, um, a, your BSc in petroleum and gas does not mean you want to move to petroleum and gas as your master's. So sometimes you can want to change your major and then uh, for some of you that are probably taking chemical courses or something like that, you might want to change your major. And then if your, if your transcript reflects that, okay, you have actually learned things uh, or taking courses um, in this, uh, that can help you in this other research or in this other, other course that you want to go in. So I think that is also one thing to look out for in your, um, your transcript. I'm just mentioning that so that some of you that want to change your major, do not just focus on the fact that, oh, I did uh, petroleum and gas engineering. So I have to do a master's in petroleum and gas engineering. So depending on the course, actually also change your major. So um, yeah, basically that's what I just want to add. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Kotha for that very interesting perspective. Um, okay, so... Um, Mr. Ahmed Sule or Mr. Abd Hafiz Shitsu, do you have any contributions to this? Right before we move into our bank of questions. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sule Ahmed Mashum. I'm currently a master's student at the Institute of Petroleum Studies, which is basically a collaboration between the University of Portacourt, Nigeria, and IFP School, France. And it's also proudly sponsored by uh, Total NAPC Joint Ventures. Basically, IPS is open to everyone. You necessarily don't have to be a petroleum engineer for you to come to IPS to study. But the key major factor is you have to be, you have to have an engineering background before you can come and you have to at least obtain, have the minimum requirement, which is to graduate with a 2 1 at least. Um, I think uh, that's all for now, then. As when I receive your question, I can prefer answers to the rest. Thank you. Okay, okay, great. Um, thank you. Okay. Thank you for your input. Okay, okay thank you. Um, Mr. Shitsu, do you have anything to add right before we go into our bank of questions? No. Hi. No, I don't. Sorry? I don't have anything to add. Go on. Okay, okay, all right. Great. Okay. Um. Thank you all for your brief contributions. Now, so we will be moving into the questions. I we have quite a number, so I'll be throwing these questions out to all the speakers, and um, hopefully we can get very, very stimulating conversations out of this. So the, the very first question that I would like to ask is, what programs do you advise petroleum and natural gas undergrads currently? to explore based on your experiences. So I think, let's start with Mr. Sorry? Hello? Uh, I will repeat my question. What programs, what programs do you advise petroleum and natural gas undergrads to explore based on your experiences? Okay, so let's start with Mr. Judah Odiachi and then we would go down the line. So okay, so yeah, okay. Um, so for petroleum and gas students, the easy line of course would be to do a master's in petroleum engineering. 
in the sense that it's easy to get funding in petroleum engineering if you can show background knowledge of petroleum engineering via your BSc. But that's not to say like you cannot explore other options, but that's definitely like the easier course. Other options, especially for people from like, uh, people in Unilag would probably be to do chemical engineering because I know back then we did a lot of courses that are chemical engineering related and appear on your transcripts. So you could always apply to like chemical engineering programs. Other, another option could be maybe an MBA. Um, but the thing about an MBA is that when, when, when applying for an MBA, you have to kind of be selective if you are looking for funding because you can apply for an MBA, get the admission and then not necessarily get funding. But if you don't have the money to pay for the fees, then, then the admission is basically, um, I don't say useless, ex except you can go ahead and source for funds. But if you don't have that opportunity, you might not be able to pursue you might not be able to pursue with that admission. So in exploring MBA options, I would say like uh, you should not just limit yourself to the top schools like the Harvard, Stanford and the likes. I know everyone would like to like have the top schools as your resume if you're trying to target an MBA, but I can use myself like as a case study uh, for applying to an MBA for graduate school. So prior to coming to the US for, to, for my master's in petroleum engineering, I applied for an MBA program in another university in the US and I got in. It's not necessarily like your top tier MBA program, but I was able to get into that program and I also got a funding um, opportunity attached to that program. So that's showing that you don't necessarily have to have like a business degree in your bachelor's but you can tow your statement of purpose, your letter of reference, and yeah, basically your statement of purpose and your letter of references to highlight things that you know would be that people, the admissions committee are interested in, in those cases. And then I've mentioned, uh, I think three courses, petroleum engineering, chemical engineering, and, uh, an, MBA. and an MBA. An MBA. You could, yeah. yeah, you could also, be interested in maybe things related to IT and like say maybe data science and analytics because that's currently like a buzzword in the industry now even in petroleum in even in the petroleum industry alone um, data science everyone is trying to move into like artificial intelligence and stuff so those could be places you can apply to like fields you can apply to because you'll be getting a, an extra knowledge coupled with your background domain knowledge of petroleum engineering and both of them could work hand in hand. Okay. Um, okay. Um, thank you for that, Mr. Judah. Um, Mr. Michael, do you have anything to add to the question? Um, um, sure. I think Judah make excellent points. Um, I agree with everything Judah said. Um, to answer the original question that was posed, I would say you can study anything, pretty much anything, right? The way I see it, your BSc is, what your BSc tells the admission committee is, you know how to learn. That's what it tells them, right? It means you went to school, you studied petroleum engineering. You didn't know petroleum engineering before you went to school, right? You went to school to learn it. Yeah. So you yeah. went there, you learned petroleum engineering, and then you showed that, you showed through the exams that you gained a good understanding of it. So if you can demonstrate a strong enough interest in a particular field, I think you have a good chance of getting admission in that field. Uh, I mean, there are always extreme cases like you wouldn't want to go, um, I'm not saying it's impossible, but you wouldn't want to go apply for a master's in uh, American history or something very, or law, for example, right? But generally, like um, very loosely, like, I would say that you can apply for basically anything, right? Um, I like that Judah mentioned data. I think the petroleum in, um, industry generates a very interesting amount of data. And the, there are not as many computational scientists or data engineers to actually um, harness this data. So that's something you should look, you could look into. But generally, the main thing I think is interest. If you're interested in something, you most likely can get a graduate degree in it if you studied a bachelor's in engineering. Yeah. Um. All right, great. That's that's very very insightful. Very insightful. Okay, so um, Miss Miss Mabansi, do you also have anything to add to the original question? 
Um, basically, I actually agree with the two of them. Uh, before Michael talked, I was actually going to say that uh, it's a question of your interest because um, that's what's important. Are you actually interested in this thing? I mean, if you're interested in it, you can exert yourself, right? You don't need to um, just limit yourself to just uh, petroleum or gas or chemical. I mean, they're like a vast array of, um, of courses. And also, yeah, basically, because um, at the end of the day, you're not going to be sitting down and be doing production and um, three-phase fluids. And, I mean, it will be, but to an extent, it's also, so basically, just try to look for whatever it is you're interested in. Whatever it is you're interested in. You can go for any engineering course. You can go for uh, fundamental sciences, all of those things, as long as it interests you. But of course, you can go for maybe history or something. Okay, great, great, great. Great. That's 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 very very fantastic. Um, Mr. Shitsu, do you have anything to add as well? Yes. <laughs> the first thing I want to say is that uh, apart first in choosing your your course of study for masters, I think you should also look at the reality on ground. Now, for example. You can see that uh, these so-called oil companies now, in a few years to come, like most of them, we transition into energy companies. It won't be oil, like it won't be oil and gas energy alone again. Like it's going to be like energy. You know, we are charging it towards um, towards renewables. So now, advice. And from what I've followed. Most oil companies now that are even recruiting, like I followed, like I followed an uh, example recruitment that I did last year. Most people that entered, that they chose, they didn't even study petroleum engineering in their in their BSc. I also followed shell recruitment that they did last year. Like, I don't think because I currently live with three shell graduates now. I live with them here in Protocols. And believe me, none of them, none of them studied petroleum engineering. And in fact, I asked one of them that just resumed this January that, uh, that how many petroleum engineers did they recruit? He said they didn't, that they didn't pick any petroleum engineer, that it was civil, she mentioned other engineering courses. So due to the reality, I will advise since you study petroleum engineering in your, in your BSc, I think for those that studied in the BSc, I think you should try and maybe move into another field, like study another thing for your master's so that you can have much advantage to understand when those companies are, are recruiting. For example, you can look into, like, there are some, you know, there are some, uh, there are some period of study that they are always applicable to every industry. In fact, these oil companies, they can't do without them. Like, look at uh, uh, the issue of data science. Hmm. So look at data science. Look at logistics and supply chain. I remember the, the recruitment that uh, the did last year. He, like, he recruited much like in the area of uh, logistics and supply chain. And believe me, and I don't think in Nigeria today we have any, any undergraduate degree in logistics. I don't think any school is offering logistics and supply chain in, uh, uh, for BS in Nigeria. If you can look into that, I think it's just few schools that are doing it in, uh, for master. So like, you can look into that. Also, you can look into sustainable energy. Like the new energy must go and do your master's abroad because in the coming years, no. So, look, so in the coming years, those are the guys that the oil company will be recruiting. So, I won't advise if you study petroleum engineering in your, in your BSc, I won't advise you to go into it in, in your MSc. But it depends on your interest. Depends on your interest. But, um, 
it doesn't mean that uh, because um, if people study in petroleum engineering, you are not getting uh, jobs in the oil company now. It doesn't mean that you, if you study that you won't get, or you are still getting, but it's just that the number has reduced. So I would like you to look into that. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you for that perspective. A very interesting perspective, which hopefully we'll, we'll try to expand on further. And then Mr. Mr. Sule, do you have any, any other things to add just like right before we go into our I next question? Just, I think they, they all said, they said it all. And I think yeah. uh, it's just your interest. What do you want? It's about, it's personal now. What do you want? What do you actually want to? And again, it's about solving problems because no, but every, all companies are hiring you to solve a problem for them. What are the challenges the oil industry are facing presently? What are the challenges? We all know, take for example now, we all know the oil industry generates a lot of huge data and yeah. not, not really, uh, they are not really uh, capable people that can handle this data. So it's, it should be very great if you are experienced, take for example in data science, and I think uh, there's a course now, which uh, I think petroleum data management, which I think a few schools uh, are actually involved with. Uh, take for example, University of Aberdeen, IFP school and all. I think that using, when you're able to get enough experience, if you're able to undergo training like that, you have uh, in, in specialized masters, take for example, in petroleum data management, you're able to at least know how to at least help the oil, uh, oil industry manage your data because it's actually expensive generating this huge data. So it will be much favorable for them if you can help them uh, convert the data to better information. So help them, okay, maybe maximize their production at a lower cost, take for example. All right. I think, um, majorly, I think majorly it's just um, your passion and solving, uh, solving uh, a problem for the oil and gas industry. All right, great, thank you. Um, Chigazi, let, allow, yes. uh, let, me, let me just say one buzzword for just to inspire maybe one person on this group. Maybe look into petroleum economics. I think the, strong, mm. the strongest um, challenges that the petroleum industry is facing right now is in the economics part of, part of it. It's not even the technology right, right now. It's more about the economics. So um, if I wasn't doing petroleum engineering masters, I'll be do, I would definitely be doing petroleum economics and maybe looking to work in the World Bank. So maybe somebody oh. might be interested in that. I may be looking to that. Well, wow, crazy, crazy. All right, thank you. Thank you all for your responses. So basically for our first question, to sum up, it's all a matter of passion, interest, and expanding or rather exploring ways to prefer value to um, companies and so forth. All right, so um, thank you all for your responses. The next question is a pretty personal question. So I think every um, each one of our speakers will have very interesting points to say. The question is, what resources did you use in preparing for your graduate admissions process straight out of the university? How early did you begin preparation and what peculiar challenges did you face? I would come over, I would, I would repeat the question. What resources did you use in preparing for your graduate admissions process? How early did you begin preparation and what peculiar challenges did you face? Okay, um, I would start with Ms. Kothwa. And then, and then we'll move on. So um, let's let's begin. Um. Okay. So I think you want to know about resources, uh, preparation time, and challenges, right? Yes. Okay, yes. So Some yes. Basically, I think um for me, at first you are, you have to first decide that you want to go to graduate school. Because for me, I decided that quite early because I know that at some point in my life, I want to go to the classroom. So, I mean, to do that, you need a PhD, right? <laughs> so, um, pretty much, and I knew that I wanted to probably do it immediately after, after university because um, I just wanted to get it out of the way and do other things in my life. So, um, I would say that... Uh, I would say my preparation started when I decided on the exams that I want to write, but that would not be um, exactly true because part of your preparation is also deciding that, oh, I want to go to graduate school. These are the courses I want to study. These are the schools I have in mind. This is the country I have in mind. And uh, this is the reason I'm selecting this country. So 
all of those things, I think, are actually very critical part of your uh, of your preparation. So all of that start way before you decide on the exams and you think about resources and all of those things. So you have to think about those things first. But as for the resources, I think it will be dependent on the school, the country, and the and the kind of exams you want to write. I mean. If you wanted to write TOEFL or IELTS, you probably need different things uh, than, uh, yeah, you need different things. So um, for GRE, I think I used uh, mostly Manhattan resources, mostly Manhattan. I used the Manhattan series, uh, I think Kaplan, and I and I, I used the, I mean, the official um, resources from GRE as well. I think for TOEFL, I just used their resources, um, the official resources from ETS. So how early did I start my preparation? For GRE, I think I prepared for about two months and a few weeks for GRE. And for TOEFL, probably a month or so before the exam. So I did most of these exams um, after, I think around February, March. February, March um, 2018. That was immediately after, after Unilag. So that's when I did most of my, most of my, uh, um, exam. As for the challenges, I think um, I think for challenges, one of the things I didn't I didn't expect to spend so much money on all of the things that I had to do because it's even though you're looking for funding, you have to be willing to spend. I mean, if you're applying to schools in US, UK, I mean, UK not all schools you have to pay application fees. But for US, you have to pay a lot of application fees. And for a bunch of other countries too, you have to pay application fees. And you know the way Naira to dollar is, so it's quite a lot of money if you're just graduating from, from school and you don't have anybody to give you that money. And of course, yeah, you have to pay for the exams and all of those things. And for some people, you have to write the exams more than once. I mean, I did write my mind just once, but then some people will have to write it more than once. And some people will have to write different kind of exams. So I think one of the challenges is um is uh, uh what what's it called? It's money. And then another thing is that um getting the right information. There's all I mean there's myriad of information on the internet. But then a lot of people are just saying things and they don't know. And then a lot of people are saying things that they don't know, but you don't know if it's true and all of those things. So basically, I think um that's it for me. All right. Um. Thank you, Mrs. Both are very great responses. Um, Mr. Michael, you've been grinning for a while now. So I think we, will, we would like to hear your response concerning the question. So up to you. Um, I'm always grinning, so do not take that as an indication that I have something to say. <laughs> uh, okay. But for this particular question, what I'm going to say now, please do not confuse it as advice. This is my own experience. It's not necessarily advice, right? Um, I started the whole grad school process in, I think it was August or September, which is extremely late, right? I did not, I did not make the decision to apply to grad school until the last moment. Uh, my plan was to apply to grad school to start actually this year. I wanted to take a gap here because I was getting tired of reading books and I wanted to just travel to a foreign country and just chill for a year and then do something new. I wanted to go on a nice like, experience. I wanted to go on exchange to a different country and then come back and apply to grad school. But that aside, um, my own challenges were, I think my major challenge was in getting a date for my GRE because I couldn't find an available date that would allow me write before my deadline. So I had to wait until people, other people who had registered rescheduled their exams because most people, a lot of people rescheduled their exams when, they're, when it's close to the date because they're not ready. So I had to wait for like exam slots to become available when people reschedule, and then I just took the earliest available date, and then I applied on the deadline day. My story, like I said, not advice. Um, I think the most of the thinking should go into what school and what program and why you want to do it, right? Um, I identified Stanford as a school I wanted to go to. Like I, I was, it was pretty easy for me. I didn't, I didn't want to go to school that particular year. So I told myself if I was going to go to school, it was either Stanford or nothing. Like Stanford was the only school I was going to go to if I was going to go to school that year. So that decision was pretty easy for me. And um, I only wrote the GRE because um, Stanford does not require TOEFL or IELTS. At least my program did not. If you finish from a school that had English as the language of instruction. 
Now, um, based on what Carter said, let me say this, right? And I applied to a top school, so maybe it's, I might be biased here, but if you apply to a top school, money would most likely not be the reason why you do not attend, right? Um, in terms of application fees, school fees, anything, right? I applied to Stanford. I didn't pay application fees. Application fee was $125, right? I did not pay that. I applied for a waiver and I got it. So if you apply, and this is why I like top schools, because these schools have the funding. Based on the, the model I gave you initially, these schools are the ones that get all most of the research grants. So they have the money, right? So what you're looking for is talent. So if you apply to a top school, I'll say it again, your mind will probably limit you before money does. Money will not be the reason why you do not attend a top school, right? If you can secure an admission, most likely you would get funding. And top schools usually have like um, fee waivers for application fees because they're trying to um, level the playing field. They don't want it to be like they missed out on some top talents because they couldn't afford the application fees. So I would encourage you, first things first, find the school and program you are interested in, regardless of how much the fees is, regardless of how much application fees is, and just apply, right? Look for the requirements. Most likely they will have some fee waivers or something that can um, help you submit your application. So look for those schools. I spent weeks on Stanford's website, just going through the requirements and um, basically getting a feel of what the school was like. My own strategy, um, I think you asked for what resources people used. Um, the yeah. resources I used was um, people, really. That was my major resource, people. I got in touch with two, two or three Stanford alumni. I got in touch with one or two Stanford, current Stanford students. Um, I talked to professors. I, I didn't talk to any Stanford professor, but like, I mean, like, in like professors um, to just to have conversations about what research was like, just to get a feel of what kind of student gets admitted to Stanford. Because I was only applying to Stanford. I only applied to Stanford. So I was, my aim was very direct. Um, what kind of students get admitted to Stanford? That was the question I was trying to answer. So I was talking to people who had finished from Stanford. I was talking to people who were currently at Stanford and I was talking to people who wanted to get into Stanford and I was seeing the differences between these three tiers. So like, I know the kind of student that Stanford is looking for and then, then I know how to like structure my application basically. I think that was my main strategy. Um, I'm going to quickly take the opportunity to answer this question on the chat. Um, what GRE scores are generally accepted in graduate schools? There is usually no minimum requirement, right? They look at your, your application holistically. Right? If, you don't, if, you don't, if you don't get a good score here, you want to make up for it in a different area, right? Um, but bear in mind, top schools would have a lot of competition. So many people would have perfect scores or near perfect scores. So if you don't have these strong scores or transcripts, you would want to make up for this in other parts of your application in terms of your SOP, your letters of recommendation, like your resume. So they're looking at this whole application and they're looking for a reason why they should allow you to come, why, why they should admit you, right? For some person, it might be that this person has a perfect GRE score. Oh my God, this guy needs to come here. This other person might be like, oh, he has five publications already just from a bachelor's. This guy needs to come here. You all might be, oh, I like this guy's motivation. This guy has an interesting story. I think you should come here. And then a lot, a lot of these, at least US schools, design the entire class, right? In a way that each of the students can contribute to the class, can um, talk to, can basically contribute to the learning of other people. So um, individ like your individuality, your, your uniqueness, your own story would like make you stand out basically. So don't be tempted to copy like, um, SOPs from somewhere, write your own story, do have typos, and then there's no, there's really no minimum requirement in terms of GRE scores, but try to get the best scores um, possible, the best scores you can get, so that in any right. case, like your application will be the best representation of yourself. Okay. Great, great. That's a very fantastic response. Thank you, Mr. Michael Jacobs. So, Mr. Shitsu, do you have anything to add concerning this question? Yes. Okay, I'm going to be talking particularly about um, uh, IPS, Institute of Petroleum Studies. Okay. So to apply to IPS, the requirement is just for you to have an um, engineering degree and a two-one. 
So when you have that, you are you must have finished your NYC. So you are qualified to uh, to apply. So after application, you will be called for a for an entrance test. So for the test, I didn't really have anything to prepare for the test. I didn't have information like it just like it was just um, a few days to the test that someone sent me a question stuff that I just went through it and I was like, this is not even what I expect. But I went to write the exam and I noticed that because anybody is uh, like anybody is allowed to apply from different engineering backgrounds, so. They wanted the level playing field for everybody. So they brought in, uh, I think, uh, let me say, O level, style for the maths, then physics. Yeah, I think there's English there too. I think there's, a, is there, I think chemistry too was there. Science subject, O level stuff, yeah. So they brought it out. And after that, they shortlisted for interview. So it's not everybody that wrote it. <laughs> So, at the end, so that's just it about IPS. GR, so that is thank you. All right, thank you, thank you, um, thank you, Mr. Shitsu. So, Mr. Judah. Um. So okay. Yeah. Yeah. I got to know about grad school and applications in my final year of studies from my good friend Abdul Afizia, who just spoke. So he made me know that they were funding opportunities and the like. So. I basically had to start my own research as regards um, the schools I was interested in going to and the program of study I was interested in. For me, it was basically petroleum engineering or anything related to business that I was interested in. So that kind of helped me narrow down the courses I was interested in and then the countries I was interested in. I was interested in basically like Europe or, or in the, on the US where I'm currently in. So knowing those two things kind of like help me source for information from the school websites. I had to find out like, first of all, when are the application deadlines for these schools? I had to know like, when, like for instance, in the US, fall admission, fall session begins in August. So your admission needs to have been sent in way, way before time. Like maybe, maybe a year to like six months before the new session starts. A new session will be starting or starts, if sorry, fall session starts in August, the spring session starts in January. So these are things you want to look out for. You want to know the session you plan on resuming in, and then you want to get your application done earnestly. So you want to know the application deadlines and design your own workflow, your template in order to meet with the application deadlines. In designing this, your template, this would include you sourcing for your transcript, you getting your letter of recommendations on time, because I mean, the, pro the professors you're going to be getting your letter of recommendations from definitely have other things they are doing. So you want to give them um, a quick, a good heads up, say like two, three months ahead of time before the application deadline so they can get it done earnestly. Um, you, for me, I was, like I said, as a, as a final year, I was already interested in going to graduate school. So for me, I did what I did was like I broke down um, my application into like tiers of school. So tiers of schools. So like for instance, for petroleum engineering, like I said, there are tier A schools, there are tier B schools, there are tier C schools. Because I was looking for funding opportunities. So if you're looking for funding opportunities and you're going to be spending your money paying application fees to these schools it's best you break, you open your chances as much as you can. So what I did was I broke down my um, application to like different tiers of schools, like tier A schools, like those are like the top schools, say in petroleum engineering worldwide, tier B schools, they are pretty good, not necessarily the best. Tier C schools, okay, they are also good, but may not necessarily be like high profile names that you know about. And then sent in my applications, 
into those different schools. So in terms, thankfully, I was able to get admission into like all these like um, tiers of schools I listed, and I got funding opportunities into these tiers too I listed. So these tier C schools I spoke about, people call them like safe schools. It's always good to like, if you're there, I keep emphasizing on if you're looking for funding, to always apply to these safe schools. So that at least you get your admission and then you get your funding because your funding is like kind of like, like you paying for your, for your like you paying for your education. So um, that's it about that. Also, I was able to leverage on the, um, the LinkedIn platform in order to connect with um, students in those schools that I was applying to in order to know what the application process was like, how they could help me um, give me inside information as regards the school, for instance. Um, if you're interested in a particular school, it's best to have inside information. You could know like, oh, there's a certain professor that is currently interested in recruiting students. So rather than going the direct route, everyone goes just applying and putting everything on their website. You can intentionally mail that professor, tell the professor that, yeah, I'm interested in so, 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 and so that you are doing. This is, I believe I can add value into what you are doing, blah, blah, blah. I did some of all this and I was able to get like responses from these professors that were like, okay, yeah, we'd like to, we'd like to discuss with you further as regards this. So that could be something you want to take into consideration. And in using LinkedIn in order to like get in touch with um, these students, it's not, it's, it does just stop at you just sending a connection request. In sending your connection request, you should let these individuals know the reason why you are even sending the connection request in the first place in order for you to at least get like a response from them to even accept your request before you like get into conversations with them. So you want to let them know, okay, this is the reason why I'm getting in contact with you, accept my request and probably we can proceed further in these discussions. And so as regards um, the resources I used, because I, I was going to, I applied to the US also, but the US you definitely, if you are going for an engineering degree, you definitely need the GRE and then you might need TOEFL depending on your school. So in using the in preparing for the GRE, I discovered lately um, for the quantitative part of the GRE. Honestly, I discovered lately, but I would advise the best um, the best resource to use for the quantitative part of the GRE is the Manhattan Prep series. All the other like Kaplan and the rest, they are pretty they are too simple compared to what you will actually face in the GRE exam. That that was one of the shortfalls. I would say that I had, but thankfully it wasn't that bad. It didn't, it didn't really affect my chances that much. And then for the verbal part of the GRE, you could use like the Kaplan books or the Baron books or Gruber guide. There are so many resources online as regards that. Um, I would also recommend using the Magush app for vocabulary building for in preparing for your GRE verbal part. And for the AWA section of the GRE, well, if you are going for engineering, I think you need like a score of like 3.5 and 4 and above. So you don't necessarily need to spend most of your time preparing for the AWA part of GRE, but spend most of your time preparing for the quantitative section. So I think I've covered um, that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Mr. Judah. And lastly, let's go to Mr. Sule for his inputs. Okay. Um, I think it's basically planning. Uh, yeah, I'm here. I think uh, firstly, it's basically planning okay. what's the school because you are open to a lot of opportunities after graduation. Which school you need to know which course are you planning to study? Which school do you want to go to? And again, when I, I think before uh, apply, when you want to apply to Brask, it's very it's safer to apply to different schools so to be on the safe side. And I think on when I was applying to IPS, because presently I'm currently at IPS Institute of Petroleum Studies, I had to reach out. I had to reach out to current students that were in IPS then and pass it. Because I believe information is power. It's it's much easier when you have information beforehand. Take for example, you have to write an exam. You have to write an entry exam at IPS. And basically it's a minimum of 15 students. Like the admission is a minimum of 15 and a maximum of 20 students. So you can see it's very, very competitive. So you need information, you need to be aware of, okay, what are the questions to be asked? What type of questions are being set? What are the methods? Which courses? What am I to do? How am I to achieve this score? 
because it's very competitive. So you need to at least be at your possible best. And uh, again, uh, the challenge is uh, you need to prepare before a year before. And I prepared for the exam a year before. And because it's very competitive, so I need Okay, you have to get a very high score. Okay, I think I saw a question now. Let me put someone asking about funding. Um, IPS is a joint collaboration between the University of Portacot, Nigeria, and IFP School France, and it's proudly sponsored by Total NMPC Joint Venture. Um, about the scholarship, I would say it's the tuition, your tuition are fully your tuition are fully covered by total. But the feeding, your accommodation, you pay for that, which is about 1.7 million. But your tuition, total your tuition. Your tuition fee is fully covered by total. But your accommodation, your feeding, because at IPS, you are entitled, okay, it's, we have classes 8 to 4, that's 8 a.m. to uh, 4 p.m. every day. And it's you write your exam on Saturday. You have a course. Take for example, you are doing you want to, you are doing a well logging and interpretation. For example, now it's between Monday to Friday. You have your courses. You, you do your well your course within uh, five days, and you write your exam on Saturday. And within the time on Monday, you have eight to four. Though there are breaks within, you have you are entitled to a tea break. You are entitled to uh to a lunch break too. And within, we tend to go for field uh field trips and company visits. So that's, I think that covers it. Your tuition is fully covered by Total, but your accommodation, your logistics, and the rest you pay, that is about 1.7 million, which will be paid by you. Total doesn't cover that. Um, I think, I think that's all for now. I think that's all for now. Okay, um, thank you, Mr. Sule, for your input. So I hope everyone of us is um, learning it Thing or two concerning this. Okay, so the next two questions are heavily focused on the students who are currently schooling abroad. So for the sake of time, we would, we would address these questions to Mr. Michael, Mr. Judah, and Ms. Cotha, respectively. So, so the, the third question is, um, how competitive is the graduate admission space specifically for for petroleum engineering abroad. And with our current undergrad, if not, what advice do you give to strengthen our competitive advantage as undergrads considering this? I'll repeat the question. How competitive is the graduate admission space abroad? And with our current undergraduate exposure, do you think we can compete adequately? If not, what advice do you give to strengthen our competitive advantage as undergrads considering this? So Mr. Michael, um, we will please start. Um, I think admission anywhere is competitive, right? Even getting into uni lab is competitive. Um, and you got in, right? Um, I'm sure you, you get the statistics about how many people apply to uni lab and all that. Um, do I think, what was the other question? How competitive it is? Yes, it's very competitive. Yeah. I think Stanford's admission rate is about, it's under 5%. But that should not yeah. bother you, right? It's not, it's not the rate, right? I mean, there are a lot of people applying, but I think each individual applicant should focus on themselves. Like, if you don't believe you can get in, you've already shot yourself in the foot, right? Um, the, the easiest way to not get an admission is to not apply. Um, just don't apply. I'm sure I'll not come knocking on your door. But if you're going to apply, apply with the belief that you can actually get in, right? Um, I told you I applied to just one school, right? It was a crazy thing to do, but I did it, right? And I finished from the same department that you, most of you are currently in. So I think... Yes, it's very competitive, but that's not a bad thing. Um, what was the other part of the question? I forgot, I'm sorry. It was, um, if not, what advice do you give to strengthen our competitive advantage as undergrads considering this? Okay, so depending on what you want to do in grad school, um, if you want to do a PhD, I would say you should look for research opportunities. Um, I know like when I first had my project advisor and everything, just like most in Laxon, I didn't really take the project seriously until towards the end. But if you're interested in like a PhD, which is, oh, by the way, I should say this, um, there's way more funding for PhD students than for master students. So 
factor that into your decision making process. If you go to the PhD, for example, in the US, you would almost likely like 90 something percent, you're likely to be funded. If I almost 100 percent, you most likely be funded for a PhD. But for a master's, the funding is less available. Um, but I think your undergraduate experience, to be honest, I think that you're very competitive with the knowledge that you have. I just think that you need to continue doing the same thing you've always been doing, right? Um, the same work ethic you've always had, just keep on putting that in. And the US system is actually, at least I can speak for the US, it's very work-based, right? In Nigeria, it's more like, um, what I call it? Um, a lot of it relies on smarts. Like if you're intelligent, you just seem to like, get the good grades and get a good GPA, um, regardless of, or almost regardless of how much you work, right? The system in the US is very dependent on the amount of work you put in. So if you're someone who's been working hard and getting your two one or two two, you will most likely do well in the US if you can get in, right? Because you have weekly assessments, things that, it's a good environment for you if you already know how to put in the work. So I think it's very competitive again, and um, you have a good chance of getting in. And um, particularly for petroleum engineering, I'll say about the US, um, the amount of interest is pretty much reducing, right? People are more interested in um, renewable energy, solar, um, generally energy resources and all that, right? So you being someone who wants to study petroleum engineering, like me, for example, you will stand out, right? Especially if you can package it very well. Right? Most people are trying to say, oh, petroleum engineering is bad and they want to do something in, uh, about clean energy. And then you come in and you're like, um, okay, for example, me, I came in and I'm like, I want to actually, I feel like petroleum engineering is going to be valid for the next several de decades, right? And I want to understand how I can contribute to using this important for more sustainably, basically, right? And you will stand out because you, you sound like you know what you're doing, right? Most people are just going with the mainstream and saying, oh, renewable energy, solar, which is awesome, which is nice. But then we, I think if you look at it um, holistically, petroleum resources are going to be valid for the next 30, 40 years, right? They're still going to be part of the energy mix. So being someone who's already interested in it and coming from a country that's an oil producer, you already have a lot of things playing to your advantage. So the main thing for you would just be to package your application basically, I think. Okay, um, thank you. Very, very great points. Mr. Judah, are you with us? Yeah, 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 I'm with you. So um, I feel like you as an Nigerian student are already competitive enough to get into any school that you're interested in getting into. What the only thing holding you back is probably just apply. So just apply and then see see where the application process leads you. Of course, people are applying from different countries. You have people who are applying all the way from India, China, and the likes. And you think they have better education systems than you, but still, it doesn't stop you from getting admitted into these schools and getting admitted with funding. I mean, we 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 are currently here and we are the same educational background that you had. So you should not let. Uh, the fact that you think, oh, because you're Nigerian, that it's go going to be a limiting factor. It shouldn't be. So for those that might be, so clearly, I mean, I basically just had the same things each and every one year probably might have. Just my basic Unilag degree and then did those exams and then applied. If you want to go the extra mile and say, oh, you want to beef up your, um, what's it called now? You want to beef up your, your chances, you might be, you might want to learn, uh, you might want to do more of like coding and learn more about programming and stuff in order to make your application stronger. Because if you look at it now, um, for a research assistantship in the US, well, this I'm talking about from a petroleum engineering case study for like a research assistantship in the US, where are you going to work? It's probably, you're going to work probably in the lab. You are going to be working like doing reservoir simulations or work cover simulations you want to do. So in order to beef up your chances as regards simulations, you want to show that, oh yeah, you have knowledge in programming and that you are kind of proficient in programming. It's not it's not like compulsory, but it's just something that you can do to like beef up your chances. Anyone coming out from like any of our Nigerian universities would definitely work with, 
will be good to go in a laboratory setup because I mean they will basically teach you this is how to use this equipment, this is how to use that equipment. Even if they don't teach you, you would read and read the manuals and learn how to use those equipment and be able to work in a laboratory setting. But when you come into like computational um, settings, it being something that you, you are not necessarily used to, it may take a, a bit of a time for you to get used to it, but it's not like you still will not be able to get it. I mean, that's that's why you're a graduate student. You're there to be able to learn and be able to get um, understand like things are pretty difficult. So just to maybe set yourself apart from like the other Nigerian students that were applying to graduate school, you might want to put the fact that you have like good computational background. So yeah, I think that would set you apart. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you for that. So lastly, Ms. Kotha, your perspective on this. Question. Uh, before I proceed, I'm gonna just switch accounts. Is that okay? Okay, sure. So basically, um, I think um, as you are right now, you're good to go. I, I like something that Michael mentioned the other time about your mind limiting you before any other thing will. Uh, I think it's uh, irrelevant whether or not you studied in, in Unilab or you studied in, I don't know, UNN uh, or whatever. It's not the school that makes you, right? I mean, it's not Stanford or Harvard that makes, uh, it's, it's the people in all those schools that make the schools what it is. So it's not about the school, it's about what you're offering, right? So I think um, the first thing is you need to get rid of the fact that uh, this mindset that, oh, you're getting an um, inferior education or something. I mean, the standard may not be all that, but then uh, there's one thing that I like to say is that you're responsible for educating yourself. So yes, it is competitive. Admission is competitive everywhere. It's competitive in UI, whatever. So, um, but then you have to put your, 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 your best leg forward you put your leg uh, your best leg forward and i think you're going to get admission it's 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 that simple but then how to you know um prepare yourself and, and make yourself stand out and all of those things uh i think one thing is it also depends on what your goals are what you want to do eventually Judas already mentioned on about um, learning programming and all of those things and i think for some of us who might have um weaker CGPA, you should, uh, if you're still in school anyway, you should try to take up a lot of extracurriculars and maybe not just extracurriculars, maybe internship and stuff you can put on your CV, stuff that can, you know, make up for the fact that your CGPA is a bit weak. I mean, of course, not 1.0, but then stuff that just makes up for that fact that your CGPA is uh, to an extent slightly weak. So try to take up things you can put up on your um, on your CV and things that are related, you know, related to probably, um, I don't know, probably take an internship in one company like that. Or, I mean, I know that's not so easy in Nigeria, but just try to do some extracurricular just to strengthen um, your application so that your SOP, you can put something. If you're saying that you graduated with the CGPA that is not strong, you can, you can you know, push up, uh, you can strengthen it with the fact that uh, despite each you were doing this, you, you know, you were doing that and all of those things. Uh, I think generally just add value to yourself, basically. Thank you, Rufa. Um, thank you, Ms. Kotha, for that. Very, very interesting point. Um, Mr. Michael, there's a quick question here for you and due to time constraints, I would, I would like to ask if you can answer it in three minutes. Um, so the question is, um, can MJ please say a little about his research study? Was it related to anything he did in the university and how has he been able to navigate through it? Thank you. Um, something about my research study, right. Uh, this is a particularly tricky question for me to answer because my research space is still very um, dynamic. A lot of things are still changing. Um, uh, I mean, in the university, I took the same 
more or less the same classes that most of you are probably taking if you're in petroleum engineering in Unilag. Uh, for my final year project, I did the um, um, riser-based pressure prediction using artificial neural networks, which I did implemented using MATLAB. So it was pretty much some computer work, which is related to what I do currently. Um, currently, I do research in reservoir simulation using uh, a custom software um, by the petroleum engineering department at Stanford. Um, it's, an, it's basically a reservoir simulator that I, I run research cases on. Um, I do not have a particular research area yet. Uh, I'm currently working on some research areas this summer, so I cannot particularly answer the question in detail. Um, but generally, the basic concepts we've learned in school would always be applicable. Um, the reservoir engineering concepts, concepts like capillarity, concepts like um, enhanced oil recovery, all of that would, is definitely relevant. If you understand that, because you need to understand those details to do any research, basically. So things like um, water, um, water injection, things like um, pore scale, core scale simulations. Especially if you did reservoir simulation, right? You'd always do that. Um, yeah, so for me, yes, yeah, I would say it's related, right? I cannot directly align them like specifically, but yeah, you'd always use the knowledge for doing research in petroleum engineering. Okay, um, I think I think that pretty much answers the question. So thank you, Mr. Michael. So the next question is still addressing um, the speakers who are currently based abroad, and I would I would like to ask this the speakers to be as quick as possible because we are slowly running out, out of time. So the next question is, what's your take on racism and discrimination of international students in foreign countries? Have you been a victim? Can you share some personal experiences? I repeat the question. What's your take on racism and discrimination of international students in foreign countries? Have you been a victim? Can you share some personal experiences? So we'll start with Mr. Michael for this. Uh, racism. Man, I mean, we're living through an, a very interesting time, right? With COVID-19 <laughs> and then with um, racial tensions in the US. Uh, What's my take on racism? I mean, it's, I think fundamentally the idea is someone somewhere thinks that they're better than some other person or, they're, or some other person is inferior to them. That's the basic idea, right? And these ideas are prevalent in a lot of spheres in society, whether it's one gender considering the other gender to be inferior, or it's one tribe considering the other, the other tribe to be inferior, or recently, more, most popularly, one race considering another race to be inferior, right? Um, yeah. Really, um, I think I might be biased here because I might, I like to think that I have a tough skin, right? Uh, some things don't get to me. But at least at Stanford, I think that the racial climate is pretty decent. I think people treat people with respect on the general level. I mean, there will always be these outliers and incidents here and there. For myself, I have not had any personal interactions with the police like since I came here on this journey. I mean, when I went to Texas some years ago, I had some personal interactions with the police, but that's another story. Anyways, um, so I've not had any, any negative interactions with the police, right? Um, but there are other subtle things that some people might, might react to differently. For example, I'm usually the only black student in my class, right? This in itself is not a problem, right? But if you, you might react to it differently, right? Imagine someone comes into your class and talking about, oh, this class, this is such a diverse group. And then you look at the group and you're, then, you're, you're, you're the definition of diversity. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's just, you're like, oh, oh, wow. So like, now it now makes you feel one kind of way. And then you can expect so, that uh, if you're, studying in a predominantly white institution, you would become suddenly aware of your skin color, right? This in itself, I don't think these in itself are problems by themselves, but it's just something to think about. For example, I'm easily the only black student. I'm easily the tallest person in the room. Um, so imagine when I walk into an elevator, for example, that's filled with white girls, and then to them, some giant just walked in. 
and then they're all smiling at you awkwardly like oh, don't 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 beat me up don't don't eat me up like <laughs> and then you're like Oh, wow. The first time it happens to you, you might even think they're giving you green light. Like, uh uh-uh, uh, this girl's the iron. <laughs> but you know, it's just. It's, it's very just, interesting. You can say, like, it's just some extra yeah, things yeah. to think it's about. Just the reaction. Um, and then you read the news, and then you see a police vehicle, and then you, you, you think twice. Um, you think twice before you go to some areas. Like, nobody's going to put a chain on your neck or beat you up or something. But it's just this small nuances that you have to pay attention to, right? Let me give you a practical example. Um, I went running with my friends um, about maybe two weeks ago. We went running around the Google campus. Yeah, like where the Google headquarters is here now. I don't think that's the headquarters, but yeah, in California. But, but then, um, um, Victoria, please, can you? Okay, thank you. Okay, so I went running around the Google campus. Normally, I tend to have like, um, significant endurance. I did manual one unit lock, so like I jogged quite a bit, right? But this particular day, I was actually, I just finished eating and then my friends called me, let's go to Google campus to go jog. And I was like, oh, sure, let's go. And then I went, even though I, I shouldn't be jogging at that time, but I went to jog and then I was getting tired easily. Because I was in an area where they were predominantly white, like this were like old white men playing golf and so on the Sunday morning, or Saturday morning, something like that. Or this during this pandemic, so everywhere is empty. And then I wanted to rest, but I couldn't stop because I didn't want anyone to come and ask, ask me what I was doing there, like in this area. This is not somewhere that you generally find like black people. So even though I was tired, I needed to rest. I had to keep going because I needed my white friends for protection, right? Because I needed, I needed to be with them. So if somebody stopped us, we can, I would have a better chance of surviving the interaction. So it's just an extra thing to think about. So uh, I think it's very subjective based on how you react to things. Um, Sure. But definitely you would become aware that you are you don't you don't look like everybody else, right? For sure. Sure. And then yeah. small, there'll be very small references like someone is explaining something and they feel they need to explain it to you twice because they basically think you're not going to get it or something like that, right? Uh, which can annoy yeah, you, okay. but I think it's just it's, it's what it is. It is what it is. A uh, very, very interesting perspective. Thank you, Mr. Michael. So up next, please quickly, Miss uh, Ms. Kotha, your experience, your experience concerning this. Okay, I think um, actually you would, immediately you leave the country and you probably get to the airport and it's no longer Africa. You can, you can feel the blackness of your skin, kind of. You become aware of it. You become aware that okay, I'm 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 not uh, I don't look like everybody else, like Michael said. But luckily for me, in my school, the postgraduate community is filled with internationals. There are a lot of international. You meet people from different countries all over the world. But uh, in my own school, um, it's my school is actually the postgraduate community diverse. I mean, I've met people from countries that I've only read about in books. So, I mean, I didn't even know exist. You know. So um, it's, it's uh, I think it's a bit easier to navigate, but then it doesn't change the difference that you are black. Even though you may be in an environment where there are whites and Europeans and, um, and brown people, the Asians, they call them brown people, um, brown people, you're still black. And then for me, you're still Muslim. So um, it's a little, um, I don't know, it's just, it becomes a little bit more obvious and uh, I'm just a little bit more aware of it. But then I have had a um, very subtle encounter with racism, uh, but I think it's a question of how you deal with it because for me, I, I, I just didn't take it as anything that would weigh me down and all of this. For instance, I recently relocated and then I mean, before I could get a place, there were people, I mean, there were stop, uh, what do they call them? These people that give you house or whatever. Uh, we don't give their house to black people, you know? You just say, where are you from? And then you say, oh, Nigeria. No, 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 I, I don't. Agents. They're not giving you. Oh. Yes, they're not yeah. giving you the house because you're black. Do you understand? Oh, and interesting. Then, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's another encounter I wanted to say. I just it just slipped to my mind right now. Um, I call, um, 
let you rent their house because because you're black, you know. So it's um all of those things. And then sometimes I walk into a store and I see people following me. I mean, I see. I mean, there are other people in the store. You're not paying attention to them. But I walk into the store and you're paying attention to me. I mean, I have my money. I'm gonna pay. Right? Why are you following me? Like. It's like, okay, maybe you're walking in to get something or something like that. I mean, it's not sad, but it's subtle, right? Because why are you following me? It's, it's just, so all of these things are there. And then, then there are the, your, your everyday interactions with people, even your so-called, um, uh, your so-called colleagues, they say some subtle, subtle things. And then if you're not somebody that's, you know, if you're somebody that takes things to heart, you're going to take it serious. And at the end of the day, you're going to find yourself cocooned in an environment of just black. And that's another, that's one thing I want to mention. A lot of us, when we leave the country, because we want to, we don't want to feel black. We don't want to, we don't want to that experience that racism, that all of those nuances that comes with being away from your own environment. We, we limit our interactions to, our fellow blacks. I think, I mean, those things would happen. Just um, try to still interact as much as possible. So um, for me, basically, that's it. just prepare your mind that you're going to go through all of those things. It's, I mean, it's the price you pay, right? True, true. Very, very true. Um, thank you, Ms. Kotha, for your perspective. And lastly, briefly, please, Mr. Judah, your perspective on this question. Yeah, um, I'm not oblivious to the fact of like the current happenings, especially here in the U.S. as regards racial discrimination. But for me personally, I don't, I don't think I've experienced any um, racial abuse or whatsoever so far. Thankfully, I'm in a place in the U.S. that people are kind of like pretty friendly. Like the South in the U.S., you have the the white guys there; they are pretty friendly, and like you could just be walking on the roads and you're you're a black guy. I, I just like maybe glance at them and just take my idea from them. But they keep looking at me and they're like, hey, good morning, good morning, sir. And in my mind, I'm like, I'm not even a sir. Like, why is this guy greeting me? I just wave and continue with my business. So interestingly, I've not really had that much of an issue as regards my, my race here. I mean, occasionally in class, you might find some like different people with their different notions. Like they could be like, oh, why, why is you should not be asking this question when you ask a question, but would you classify that as racial racial abuse or something? I don't know. For me, I've just like really primed myself to really not care what, what anybody has to say, whether as a regards of my color or anything. I think it's just the way I've conditioned myself and conditioned my mind. I really don't care what anybody wants to think. If I ask a question and they feel, oh, you should not be asking this question, I really don't care. I'll ask whatever question I want to ask and get the response that is appropriate for the question I ask. So that's that's basically the way I go I go about my things here. Yeah. And like um, the other um, folks have said about you being black and getting like into a black community and the likes, I think that's basically like really bound to happen if you're lucky enough to find a place where they are even like blacks. It's natural that, that you gravitate towards people that are similar to you. Um, but in spite of this, I mean, your search for diversity, I mean, that's probably one of the reasons why you're going abroad. You should still try, like Kauta said, try to get, um, try to interact with folks that are different from you. You might be lucky or you, you, you might be lucky enough to find people that really do not do things as regards uh, along racial lines and really do not care. Like you're not pretty open-minded. And if you're able to meet folks like that, congratulations to you and if you don't sorry about that but i don't think you should let that be a big deal and let it weigh you down you just get along with your business and do what you came to do great response from you mr julia thank you for your perspective okay so at this point i would like to ask the speakers to please address the next few questions with with um with speed and as much as and as comprehensive as they possibly can so it's not my first time around there right okay um Sorry, Miss Miss Victoria, can you? Okay, thank you. Okay, the next two questions are from YouTube, and and they will be and they address to all the speakers. So, again, please with with speed and as much com and as much detail as possible. Thank you. Okay, so the question is, what advantage or what advantages does a first class student have 
over a second class upper student that wants to apply to a top school? I repeat the question, what advantage or advantages does a first class student have over a second class upper or a second class lower student that wants to apply to a top school? Okay, so at this point, let's start with Mr. Shitsu. Well, I think I don't have uh, much to say on I'm not abroad, I'm not in the US, I'm not, I'm schooling here in Nigeria. Anyway, but, but IPS is still a top master's institution in Nigeria. So we'll have to so, I'm in school and so, 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 uh, so others that are schooling abroad, thank you. Um, okay. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, okay, so uh, Miss Miss Cotha, can I take the floor for this question? Then. Um, okay, I think I would have preferred you ask them to that, but I'm just going to say that um, they do have advantages because, I mean, there's some scholarships that are just specifically for first class. I mean, if, you, if you're not on a 4.5, don't bother to apply, they put it there. So there are those ones. But then I think in the actual sense of it, it still goes down to how well you can distinguish yourself. It still bugs down to it at the end of the day. Because uh, the, the, the admissions that um, a first class you, would, you uh, would not get, and you would get because uh, probably you have, um, you have a very strong SOP. And I'm going to retreat this, your SOP, your SOP, your SOP, your SOP, all over again. So, um, they have an advantage in the sense that there are some um, scholarships that are specifically only for first class, but beyond that, um, I don't think so. I don't think there's any other thing. But you can ask MJ. Let's see. Okay. Okay. Um, MJ. MJ. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. So remember, I said that I uh, tried to make this. Part. Remember, I said the applications are uh, examined holistically, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. what advantage would a first class student have? Um, bear in mind that these schools are receiving people from everywhere, right? And they're trying to differentiate different students, right? The main thing that is needed for you to do graduate studies is an understanding of the undergraduate concepts, right? But because they cannot meet you in person to see whether you actually understand these concepts and whether you'll be a good fit, they're relying on what you're submitting, your grades, your resume, and all of that. So face value, a first class student seems to have a better understanding of the concepts than a second class student, right? That's just what it seems. But then the other part of the, of the application that might counter that, your GRE scores, your SOP, your articulation, your resume, your previous experiences, your research papers might change the narrative, right? Let me give an example. I think from of all my friends that applied to Stanford um, with me, I think I had the lowest GPA, right? We're all first class students that applied to Stanford. I think I had, the, I probably had the lowest GPA among all of us, but I was the only one that got into Stanford. Right. So if you were just grading by just GPA, you would say, okay, this guy should have gotten in. He had like a 4.9 something. Or this person should have gotten in. He had like a 4 point, a 5.0 or something. But these guys didn't get in. And I had like a, a lower GPA, but still a first class and I got in. So your GPA is not a determining factor. It's a nice to have because you would have people from Asia, China, and the likes with perfect GPAs. And everything. So you, to be competitive, you want to show, like, you want to have as high a GPA as you can. So generally, my advice is if you can increase your GPA, by all means, increase it, right? Graduate with the best GPA you can graduate it, right? For example, let me give you an example of myself. I got into uni lag and I just wanted to get a first class. That's what I wanted. It was just first class or nothing, right? I entered and I was like, 4.50, oh, for sure, I'm going to do it, right? And I was just doing minimal effort. Minimal effort required to just get the 4.50. That was my strategy for the whole time. I was going to balance my entire life, social life, academic life, every other life, traveling, everything, and still get a 4.50. And then I went to the US in 2017. And then I realized that, ah, wait, oh, to, to have like, to dispense yourself, you want to get like the, the best GPA possible, right? So before that point, I was comfortable with the 4.50, right? When I came back from the US, I was like, oops, okay, I think I'm going to try to get, I'm, trying, I'm going to try to get the best GPA I, I can. Before that, I was just always getting one or two carrots every semester. Just being all right. Carrot means C's, by the way. And then, <laughs> um, and then when I when I came back from the US on that short trip, I my final exam in the in um in New York, like I got the 5.0 that semester because I actually wanted to push my GPA just as high as it can, as it could be. So my final semester in University of Lagos, I got the 5.0, something that I wasn't getting before then, right? 
But again, your GPA is not going to absolutely disqualify you if you can sell the other parts of your application. Basically, you're trying to tell the person with this application that, see, you would want to meet me. I can do this work. That's all you're trying to portray, right? Doesn't yeah. really, doesn't even really, really matter. You're great. If you can demonstrate that, see, I have this experience, I have this knowledge, I can apply this knowledge, and I can I'll work like yourself. crazy. Sell yourself. This is me, and I think you'd like to meet me, and I can do this work. That's all. Uh, great. Very, very great responses. Uh, Mr. Judah, do you have any anything to say, any perspective? Yeah, the question? it's basically summed up in the last two words that Michael said, sell yourself. And how do you sell yourself? Basically from your statement of purpose or your personal statement. And I would like to emphasize from your letter of references. So see, when you're asking these professors to write your letter of references, at times, some of these professors or lecturers have like a generic letter of reference that they could send for any student. They just ask for your names and some things you did in school. And they put that that I put that there. That doesn't necessarily sell you. It's not descriptive enough. So if you have like a personal good relationship with, with these people that are writing a letter of recommendations, you might want them to describe like certain scenarios of things that you did and how you added value maybe to a team or how you were able to go about doing things that were not necessarily in the norm. So you necessarily you want to highlight that part and the fact that it's not coming from you like your statement of purpose is coming from someone else gives that like more credence so basically just sell yourself in whatever means possible all right great um thank you very much for your response the next question is also a question from youtube and it is addressed specifically it has a tone of it's, it's basically addressing um a uk united kingdom application um, there isn't anyone here currently in the UK, but if any of our speakers have any knowledge to share there, it would be very much appreciated. The question is, please, do I need to write all these exams, GRE and the likes, to apply to schools in the UK? Okay, so I apply to the UK. You do not necessarily, you do not need a GRE to apply to the UK. You may not necessarily... It, it depends on the university you're interested in applying to, to the UK. Some, okay. most of schools in the UK prefer you apply with an IELTS. That's um, okay. an English certification exam. Or you could um, apply with a statement from your university saying that you were taught in English. So that letter might be good enough for you to apply. So basically applying to the UK is way easier than applying to like schools in the US, Canada and the like. So it's pretty much straightforward. Yeah, and for applying to the UK, you might want to like look look around for like scholarships like Chevening, Commonwealth, and the likes. The good thing about scholarships like Chevening and Commonwealth is like is that the fact that they don't necessarily care whether you are a first class or a two one student. If you see two two students getting Chevening scholarships, and these are like really good scholarships that will fund your degree in a UK institution. All right, um, thank you, Mr. Judah. That was very very insightful. Miss Cawthor, do you have anything to add here concerning the, the question? Nothing really. Um, I think um, whether you're going to the UK or US or whatever, you should check for the schools you're going for. Just try to, if, they, if they're specific about some exams, write those exams. If they're not, but I think generically, UK, you don't need GRE generically. UK is mostly IELTS, but still try to research the schools you're interested in specifically. All right, thank you. And MJ, lastly, do you have anything to add? Oh, um, I think these guys have pretty much said it all, really. Like, just look look at the schools. Different schools have different requirements. For example, people think that you need to definitely write a TOEFL, right? I had to check the Stanford website and the application requirements to know that I did not need TOEFL. I did not need IELTS to apply to Stanford. I only wrote GRE. That's the only exam I wrote, right? So look for the schools you are interested in. If you're interested in them enough, you'll be willing to spend the time on their website to learn about what they require and what kind of students they admit. I mean, I, God, I spent weeks on Stanford. I spent a whole month on Stanford website. I was looking up LinkedIn profiles of current students in the department. I knew many people's names before I came in here. I know somebody's name and, and GRE score. I've never talked to the guy before. Like, so I like, spent some time. I think, I don't, know, I don't know how true this is, but I think that many grad programs are looking for people who are obsessed about something, borderline obsessed. Like, because those are the most productive people. You're willing to spend all your time on something, right? So they want to see that you're borderline obsessed about this thing. 
you can be in, you can study petroleum engineering for bachelor's and say you want to do a master's in computer science and if you can show that obsession that see i have tried all my best i have gone i have looked at the available material online i have studied i have done this so just invest the time look at what these schools are interested in what they, what they require and then apply there are no um, blanket rules is it okay if i add something yeah. i'm just gonna right, sure sure um, definitely okay, so, but please um, as fast as possible okay just like he said go through the website for actually for you for a lot of schools i think in you for a bunch of schools in us they actually they have selected schools like you are unilag and all of those things in nigeria where you don't need tofu even though the, one of their requirements is tofu for international students so they have there are some schools that actually have exemption for schools like unilag ui and all of those things so like michael said spend a lot of time on the website to actually find out don't waste your money on writing exams you don't need all right um great okay, thank you okay so there's a question coming in from youtube right now and it's it's um, also targeting the speakers who are currently um schooling abroad it's it goes i don't have a personal relationship with most of my lecturers as i was mainly under the radar although i came out with a four point something results how effective are non-academic referrals? I'll say that again. I don't have a personal relationship with most of my lecturers as I was mainly under the radar, although I came up with the four point something results. How effective are non-academic referrals? Kothar, can you please start this? To be honest, uh, I'm not sure. I don't know. Um, for some schools, they would require that um, they would specify that maybe you should have um, somebody in academic and somebody in non-academic setting, some schools will do that. But if they don't do that, I really, I, I honestly don't. Okay, um, thank you. Um, MJ. Yeah. Um, I think it's hard to work out, I said, as I said, that some schools specifically require academic referees, and then you should follow those requirements. But some, most schools will just say referees. I think, like I said earlier, even though Carter seems to disagree, it is more important what they write about you than who they are. I didn't say it's not important who they are. It's just way more important what they write about you, right? I personally, my application to Stanford, I, I included two. In fact, out of all my referees, one, let me tell you my four referees. One was my project supervisor at Unilag, like Dr. Imo. One was uh, an adjunct professor at Unilag. He already taught me one class, right? He was a retired industry professional, Dr. Agbin, that taught petroleum economics. And two of the other, and the other two were my um, colleagues at Adax Petroleum, where I did my IT. So four people, and only one was an actual full-time lecturer, right? It is way more important what they write about you. I did projects at Adax that these people knew about. We worked together on these projects. And these people actually liked me. Right. It is very important that your recommenders actually like you, like you enough to put in the work to write a good recommendation for you. Right. If you're going to apply to a top school, you won't want to receive a generic recommendation. He's very hardworking and resourceful. He's smart and punctual. He's this and that. He takes he pays attention to detail. That's not going to give you what you're looking for. You want somebody that actually puts in the work and apply as if it's them that wants to go to this school. They need to like you enough. Right. Out of this, my four people that I said that recommended me, I've been to three people's houses. And these wow. are people that I met in school or professional settings. It's not like I knew them before. I met Emo in school. I didn't even like him at first. Now he's my party. I, I met Dr. Agbim in school. I've been to Emo's house. I've been to Agbim's house. I've been to one of my colleagues at Adak's house. And there's only one of them I've not been to his house. Do you understand? So, and... I had this relationship with these people way before I even thought I was going to go to grad school. Because I'm a relationship person. I told you, my biggest resource I used when I was applying to Stanford was people, right? So I already built this relationship way before grad school. So it was easy for me to just say, oh, hello, sir. Um, I'm actually considering applying to grad school at Stanford, and I was hoping that you would help me um, um, prepare a recommendation. Because see, so for example, Stanford business process, they actually send an individual link to these guys right? They will create a profile, like an actual profile. They'll fill a questionnaire and then they'll submit the application without you seeing it. I did not see my Stanford recommendations. I have still not seen them. I don't even know what they wrote, but I trust that these guys put in the work to write something nice for me. I haven't seen it even till now. Do you get? So I don't even know if he had grammatical errors or something. 
do you, do you understand? So yeah. just it's very important that you find people that like you. If they like you and can put in the work, right? Don't look for generic. Um, okay, one more thing. Don't go to who everybody is going to. I, this might sound cliche, but if the same lecturer is writing, especially when you're applying to the same school, the same lecturer is recommending four people, five people, you cannot say this person is the best, this person is the best, this person is the best. Let me give you an example. I wanted to go to one professor in Unilag to, uh, for your recommendation, but he had already recommended two people for my set. I was not trying to be third best, all right? I was not trying to go to someone who had already, and he even, he even cleared me, told me straight up that he had recommended this guy, he had already said that this guy is the, has given this guy like five over five, and he has given this guy four over five. There's no way I'm going to come up three over five. Do you understand? So I just took him off, even though I really wanted that recommendation. So find people that like you and know you enough to write actual original content. Do you get So that's, that's pretty much right. it for me. Okay, great. And very quickly, please, Juno, your take. Or has it taken? I think it was. Yeah, so um, I just had like, for most of my applications, I just had like one recommendation from a professor in lab because I was basically one of the lowest key people in our set. So my only recommendation per se for majority of my applications, my only academic recommendation came from Dr. Imo, came from people from uh, industry and other folks like that knew me, like in an academic setting, even doing Unilab, but not necessarily in the department. So like they said, you just want to get a letter of recommendation from people that can really sell you, sell, sell you and sell that, uh, say, say that this person is really good. So that, that's basically it. All right, great, great. Thank you all for your responses. Okay, for the sake of time, we'll be taking just two more questions. And after that, we'll open the floor for general comments and general questions. So the next question is going to be addressed to all our speakers. And the question goes, can you please shed more light on local scholarships like PTDF, Shell, Total, et cetera? Um, for this, I'll start with Mr. Sule. Oh, Mr. Sunday, are you close? Okay, yeah, I'm with you, I'm with you. Okay, uh, can you yeah, I, I would, can you? Okay, go on, no, go on, go on. Okay, I'll repeat the question. The question goes, can you please shed more light on local scholarships like PTDF, Total, and Shell, and how we can access them as undergrads? Okay, I think I can talk about uh, the Total Scholarship. Okay. Then I think Judah should be able to talk about the PTDF. Okay, okay, about the total scholarship is basically IPS, for take for instance now the Institute of Petroleum Studies. Once you the main thing is passing the exam because it's very competitive. Once you pass the exam, the second phase is the interview stage. And the interview stage you have on your panel, you have uh, people from Uniport, you have people from a representative from IFP school. And I think, and also there's going to be like a video conferencing with another IFP lecturer in France. So I think once you can pass the exam and you can pass the interview stage, I think the rest is covered. Total covers your tuition fee. Your tuition fee is covered by Total. And I think the only thing you pay for is just your feeding. Because at IPS, we basically we live together because it's, everything is all about teamwork. Because after the program, once you start working, you get into the industry. It's teamwork. Everyone works together as a team to achieve the best results. So it's, I think uh, that's all I can say as regards that. I think uh, Judah should be able to talk uh, better about PTDF. Okay, uh, Mr. Judah, you, you have the floor now. Please talk about PTDF. Okay, so as regards like local scholarships, local scholarships are way different from like the way our research assistantships and the likes are. So if you are applying for PTDF, I would advise anyone applying interested in graduate school to apply to as many scholarships and funding opportunities as possible. So applying for PTDF, you should know, you should understand how this um, how this um, application process is structured. So for PTDF, I say they actually work like on a quota system. So they look at the people from your state. So basically you have to be among the best five or best 10 individuals from your state in order to get awarded the PTDF scholarship. So these are some of the things you want to take into consideration. So in order to like, probably have a better, uh, a good shot at your PTDF uh, application. I think the, one of the most important things or major keys is actually your PTDF scholarship essay, because PTDF does not require you to write any exam and the likes. 
In fact, even when you apply for the PTDF, they might even say you should not even have applied to the universities, that PTDF might help in your application to the universities as even after getting the PTDF scholarship. So you want to like really spend so much time on your scholarship essay. And then this is one thing that I have noticed from looking at other people's scholarship essay, comparing it to mine back then, is that people talk about writing their scholarship essays like, oh, I want this because of this. I want this for me. I want this scholarship for me. But when you're writing like a scholarship for PTDF, you have to understand like what is the reason behind PTDF giving you this scholarship. You have to understand that they are actually giving it to you because they want you to develop the Nigerian petroleum industry. So you have to show in your essays, like this is how I believe I can contribute value to the petroleum industry. So you should not center your scholarship essays like when you're applying for PTDF, Chevening, Commonwealth and the likes, you should not center your scholarship essays all about just you. Oh, it will help me do this. It will help my family do this. You have to look at the big picture and know how you can propel this thing forward that any, any, of, any of the people on the admissions committee or the application committee looking at your essay will be like, yeah, I think this person is the person that would really like to give you because he's thinking big, looking at the big picture. So that's basically that about that. Also, I would just like to add for those scholarships like um, Nigerian scholarships like PTDF, NAE, AGIP and the like, it will help if you could actually go online, like on LinkedIn, look at the people that were past scholars or past recipients of this award, just get in touch with them. Especially if, if they are also from your school, it could help like if they, if they are from the same university you graduated with, they are alumni, this would even can like help them even get in touch with you quicker on LinkedIn, but this should not be a limiting factor, whether or not they're alumni of your school, just get in touch with them, see how they can help you as regards the application process. They may be able to even let you know, okay, these are the questions that were asked. Like for instance, during PTDF, we had to go through interviews and they could let you know, okay, these are the type of things you should look out for, blah, 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 and the likes. So that, that's it. Hello? Okay. Okay. Oh, face face. Yeah. Yeah. Would you like to contribute to this? Because I think you have like a lot of knowledge about this scholarships, PCDF, and the like. Okay. Uh, you don't already talked about uh, PCDF. Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, the other, like uh, the others, the um, Ajib, SPDC, um, what again, NLNG. So most of them, like, okay, for Ajib, for NLNG, and for Shell, SPDC, they give, like, mainly for, uh, to go to school in the UK. That's what. <laughs> Another thing is that most of them, they have quota system for the people from the South-South, from the oil producing states. If you are from the oil producing states, I will advise you to look towards uh, SPDC. And if you are from river states, look towards NLNG very well. Yeah. So, and make sure you know how to solve, like most of them use um, dragnet for their tests because you write tests. NNG, NNG test is, uh, is conducted by WAHEC, WAHEC absolute test section. But uh, IGP and uh, what's the name? And I think it's a, a dragnet. You go out to solve dragnet question very fast because it's like, that thing is just like, let's say, like the person that can solve dragnet question very well, he gets it, that's it. Because I wrote uh, last year, I I wrote uh, a Jeep test, yes. So you have to be fast and know how to solve uh, dragnet questions. Just maybe you go and get the question and start solving them now, so that when it's time, you know how to like solve. Especially the the um, what's the, the mathematical part. Yeah. Yes. And for 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 NLNG. Uh, you have an advantage if you are from the south south because I think they take more than half. No, yes, more than half from river states, then one one from uh, the other geopolitical zones. So, and they they use the uh, WAHEC, WAHEC aptitude like WAHEC aptitude test uh, department organized. It. Although theirs is not that hard, but still, you know, maybe you are from the southwest now. You are competing 
they want to just give maybe just one person from the southwest so you are competing f- with so many people although although uh, the number of people that used to write nng is very small because they used to ask for IELTS. IELTS is a very important requirement to write an NNG uh, scholarship exam. So if you don't write it, they will send you back that day on the morning of the exam. Like they won't allow you to write the exam. So, so if you can look towards that, your IELTS package it and try and get a very good score in the, in the exam, then you get in. That's all I can think. Um, sir, now. I would like to add some things can i just quickly add some things yeah yeah sure 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 yeah so concerning the nlng like um as you said interestingly i also wrote the nlng exam back then currently now they are accepting tofu scores but your tofu scores should be like 110 and above so but if per adventure your score is not is not as high as what is like for tofu maybe it's a bit lower i i still think you should give it a shot i mean i had a 109 on my tofu score and as at that point they had not yet like even started aligning tofu scores but i just decided to like take the risk and just go for the exam and i was able to like plead my case and the lady was like okay don't worry go ahead and write the exam and let's see what comes out of it so you should not let maybe like one score or, or the likes hinder you from taking taking your shots and stuff also i want to mention about the ifp school in france because i know the ifp school in france actually like um gives um scholarship to at least one student whenever they apply to like their schools like you don't necessarily need to be sponsored by total or the likes feel free to apply to ifp school in france they also like personally sponsor a student yeah all right um thank you mr shito and thank you judah for your contribution so the last question before i open the floor out to our participants talks about work um, about work so the, the question is um, do you really think it is necessary for, or it's important to do your master's before or after you work? Should you gain some sort of work experience right before you go into the master's? So I'll be opening this, I'll be throwing this question out to all our speakers. Um, so um, if you could, if you care to start first, Judah would would really like that. So it's um, basically a matter of choice. It depends on you. You don't necessarily need to have work experience before going for a master's. There's really no um, true or false as regards this kind of question. It's as regards your preference. I did not have any work experience before coming for my master's. In fact, here in the US, people go straight from their bachelor's to a PhD program and don't even have work experience. So you should, you should not let that be a limiting factor. Say, oh, I don't have work experience. I think I would like to source for work experience before applying to a master's to dilly dally and know what it is I truly like. Because the truth is that when you actually get to, if you actually get a work, what's the, what's, how shall we that you're even going to like whatever it is that you're doing in that work? I mean, even as a petroleum engineer, when you're working in the industry, you're not just working as a petroleum engineer, you're working maybe as a drilling engineer, a production or a reservoir engineer. And many a times you're not, the one who decides where you want to be placed, the company actually places you there. So it depends on you. If you actually want to go and have that work experience before applying to graduate school, feel free. If you want to apply to graduate school straight out of university, feel free. So the choice is yours and the ball is in your court. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you very much for that. So MJ, please your input on this. Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question briefly? Okay, um, the question is, um, how important is it for you to work right before you go for your master's? Is it, really, like, is it really important? And do we need to consider doing like working first in the industry just um, right before our master's or what do you think? That's basically the question. Okay, so allow me to just drop this engineering almost jargon, but I think that success is both a path function and a state function, right? Um, mm, mm. There are many, there are many parts to this. Like there are many ways to approach this. Some people go to grad school right from undergrad. Some people work first. I think all of us here were from the same set, and we basically went almost straight to grad school. I worked for sixteen months in financial services um, before going to grad school. But I'll say this: um, I think, and this is just my personal opinion. I think a grad school is more valuable to you when you have some work experience doesn't mean that it's useless when you're fresh out of school, but work experience gives you perspective. 
gives an opportunity to find out what actually matters to you. What parts of the business are you actually interested in? Especially if you want to do like an MBA or a PhD. Like if you worked for a bit, you can see, okay, let's say you worked in an oil company and then you find out that your interest is in produce water management, right? This is something that you might not even get to be very familiar with when you're in school because nobody's teaching you how to manage produce water in uni like petroleum engineering. We're talking about reservoir engineering, production engineering, drilling, uh, formation evaluation. I think the first time I actually came in contact with police water was at ADAX, right? Because we actually had a police water problem at some point. And we had to think of ingenious solutions to solve the problem. And like I said, what school does for you is teach you how to think. Let me tell you that like, some of the solutions to this police water problem we had then was, I mean, very simple concepts, things that you don't even necessarily have to go to school to think about. It's very ingenious. For example, one of the solutions we proposed was to isolate rainwater, like regular groundwater from rain and everything from the police water. Before, before that point, we had like the police water and the rainwater were always getting mixed, like groundwater and water would get mixed and then increase the volume of police water that we're having to handle. And then we ended up automating that process, isolating the groundwater from the police water, automating the process using automatic forms. And basically we solved that problem. Right. So work experience, like I said, just I think it would make your master's or graduate studies more valuable. Right. When you've worked somewhere for going for an MBA, you're you're more intentional. You know what specific resources you're looking for. You know what connections you're trying to make. Just like when you started a company and then you go for an MBA, you know, you know you're looking for VC funding, for example. Not like when you're just thinking about the idea and you just go to grad school. So it will be useless to you. You still learn a lot whether or not you have work experience, but. I just, if you have work experience, personally, if I had work experience, if I had the opportunity of working, let's say, at ExxonMobil or Chevron or somewhere for a bit, if I did my master's, I'd have taken it. Right. All right. All right. Great. Great. Very, very great response. Um, up next, Mr. Shitsu, please, can we take your perspective on this? Yes. I think uh, if you worked before going for your master's, I think you will appreciate uh, what they are teaching you very well, better than people that have not worked before. But, but you know, uh, like it shouldn't be a prerequisite for you because in fact, how many people even get the opportunity to work safe now before going to going for masters? So if you are like, if you're opportunity to get a job, I think you should take the job. Uh, maybe later, if you have interest in going for my, you can go. But if you don't, but if you didn't get any opportunity to work, I think you, you can just go straight for your masters. Because in fact, some international companies, there are some international companies that uh, that the least uh, educational qualification they they accept into their graduate program is an MSc. So to them, your MS is like a BSc. So if you, so without MS, you can even get in. So you have to, so you, so you be forced to go and do your MSc after your BSc before you can get the opportunity to enter those companies. So it depends. I think if you get a good job after your BSc, you should take it, sure. But, but if you don't have any opportunity like that, I think you can go for MSc. That's all. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, next up, Mr. Sule. Okay. Um, for me, well, it's, it's a matter of choice again. Like when I finished my uh, BSc, actually, like my intention, I had mine was to just go to a graduate school. Like, let me get more knowledge. Let me get more knowledge. Let me acquire more knowledge about petroleum engineering before working. But it, again, it's it's subjective, it's, it's up to you. Everyone knows it's, it's personal. What do you actually want? Do you want to work before going to, uh, before starting your MSc? Or do you want to do your MSc before uh, working? I think it's personal, but it's much better because if you are experienced, take for example, you want to do your MSc and maybe you, you, are, you are a production engineer or you are a server engineer in a company for maybe three, four years. You're able to relate more with whatever you are doing in the program because most of the things now you've done the practical while you were working you've done your, you've had the practical experience but now when you are doing your MSc you now you're not getting the theoretical experience so you're able to appreciate more you're able to correlate compared to someone just going to uh 
to just starting the MAC without working. So it's it's two sided, Sha, but it's much better for me. It's, it's much better for you to, to work in the industry for a few years before starting your MSc. So I appreciate what you have been taught. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your response. And finally, Ms. Cotha, please your closing perspectives on this. Okay, um, for me, I would agree with all the other speakers. It's a question of choice, but then it is not a prerequisite. It, is, it doesn't mean you have to or you shouldn't. But like MJ said, it is valuable. It gives you perspective. You know, working gives you perspective. It tells you, do you actually really want to do this? I mean, it's it's a different ball game when you're coming directly from the from your from an academic environment, going to an academic environment. Then when you're coming from you've been to an academic environment and you've been to a work environment and then you're going into an academic environment, especially if you're doing research. I mean, it makes it even a whole lot easier. You know the kind of research questions you want to ask, the kind of questions you want to solve. You don't go from, um, you don't just go and pick up one theoretical research objective that <laughs> it's not even an actual problem in the industry anyway. But if you have the, um, um, I mean, the work experience, you know what is actual problem and what actually yeah, sure, yeah. interests mm -hmm. you and the kind of question you want to solve, especially for your research. Okay, okay. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. So um, a big thank you to all our speakers so far. I believe the questions we've asked have um, incorporated a lot of our concerns and, and many of the questions on our minds. But right now, the floor is open to the audience. We'll be taking just two questions for the speakers. So please, if you have a question to ask, unmute yourself, address the speaker and ask your question. Thank you. Because our time is fast, it's fast spent, so please, as fast as possible. I repeat, are there any questions for our speakers right now? If you have a question, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Good evening, um, uh, Judah, Judah Odachi, can, can you please hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, you said something about the UK, some UK scholarships and the rest, and I'm very much interested in that. Uh, by God's grace, I've you know I've been applying for a while now, and fortunately, I've gotten um, I've gotten admission, but a few of my uh, scholarship applications came out negative, so I'm you know kind of in a fix right now so i have to probably defer before i apply again for another one but i wanted to ask something um that's why i text uh here about um a guidance on how to write personal statements essay and the rest but i also ascend, i attended one of um one scholarship you know seminar recently and then they said something about writing books publishing you know that um if you have published books and articles and the rest and that would really help and i don't really know how to go about that and i'll probably just i'll have to write ilts maybe this month or next but the publishing aspect and then you know knowing exactly what to put on or how to coin your coin your essay or your personal statement to fit the purpose is what is really my problem because I want to give it a second shot and I pray I get it this time. Okay, so as regards um, the publishing, I'm guessing you are talking about publishing of research papers. Exactly. And right now I'm working, I'm not in school right now. Judah, you're on mute. You, um, you muted your mic, Judah. Oh, oh, okay, sorry. Uh, I said, okay, so um, for publishing, that would be like as regards um, research papers, but you said you are currently working, so I don't, I don't know. I mean, people working still are able to like publish research papers. It's 
doesn't necessarily mean that you have to like work in a lab before you can publish research paper. It's just for you to like see a problem and like work your way towards a solution for that problem and then publish it and get get it out there. So as regards um the part of um the one about um how to coin your statement of your personal statement or says like I would always say like first of all know what that scholarship is about know what it is like who are the people that this scholarship is actually looking out for for instance scholarships like Chevening are looking for people different from what PTDF is definitely looking for PTDF is looking for people that can help like the Nigerian oil and gas industry Chevening and the likes are looking for people that are like related to like social work social development and things like that so those are the things that you want to put in your essays that shows, okay, I am the person that you are looking for. And then I would also recommend that um, there are a lot of like essay writing um, services that people advocate for online. Like after you've written your essays, feel free to show it to these people and you might have to pay. I mean, if it's something that you really want, you might have to pay so that they can like help you like edit your essays, go through it and say, okay, you should actually have this here. This is how you should structure your essay um blah 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 and most importantly like i've mentioned before i would say you should leverage linkedin to get in touch with people who have gotten those scholarships see how they can if they can be of help if they could probably share you their essays and see what it is like what is their winning strategy what is the thing that actually works in order for you to like uh, make right. headway with these scholarships yeah, that's exactly what I've been trying to do, but it's not so easy finding these people. And uh, most of them don't give out their uh, scholar, uh, their personal statement. Those write-ups, they don't give them out easily. And then, um, secondly, there are other components they they require, like um, some voluntary work you do and the likes. And personally, I don't know what which of my skills I can leverage to get like all those voluntary works. I don't know what exactly I should do, which group I should join, you know, stuff so, like that, that I can also get points from those things. So there are actually like a couple of so many NGOs in Nigeria that you can get in touch with and join them and tell them that they are interested in volunteering with them. It could just be in order for you to gain experience as what volunteerism is all about. And these are things that you can like put in your essay or you can use to back up your, back up your application processes. And just like what, please? What? Like what NGOs? Like I don't really know. I didn't. I didn't school here, so it's a bit difficult, you know, getting acquainted with some of this stuff. Okay. Sorry. Um, so there's. I I don't know like NGOs. I know there are so many NGOs. Like it probably would just be like you making like a Google search as regards. NGOs currently in Nigeria, you probably find NGOs who are like interested in helping disabled people, NGOs that are driven towards like poverty alleviation and the likes. And you, you don't even necessarily have to only start an NGO. You can actually do something from your own, like on your own, like just start up something on your own. There's there's a particular girl that's been like telling a LinkedIn story uh, who started like an educational teaching awareness to people from less privileged homes. I was able to like get some um, like funding to Harvard and get like even people donated to like a GoFundMe page. I mean, she just started this thing on her own. She did not necessarily need to have an NGO. So if that's the course you want to talk like through like social work and social development and the likes, an NGO would be like an easy way because there's already a platform for you to just leverage on or you could actually just set out and just start on your own. So like I said, you could just go online, check check for to find out if there are like a couple of NGOs in the fields that you're interested in and see how you can sign up to continue to assist them and gain experience and add those things to back up the application. Thank you very much. Okay, um, really? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Okay, um, thank you, Mr. Edis, for your question. Okay, so our time is far spent. Uh, and before I introduce our president to give the the closing remarks, I would just like um, the speakers to say a couple things, like just a few closing statements in 20 seconds or less. So um, let's begin. Ms. Cotha, if you could just end. Um, 
I didn't get to what you said. What would you like us to say? Closing remarks? Just if you, yeah, 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 exactly. Closing remarks. Okay, yeah. I think um, basically I would just say that if you want to go for graduate study, set your goals early and know exactly what you're li- looking for. If you know exactly what you're looking for, it's actually easier for you to get in. I mean, if you have a target, it's easier to eat it than when you don't have a target. So know exactly what you're going for and do not limit yourself. Don't think, oh, oh my God, I graduated from Unilag, I'm going to be competing with... <laughs> All those ones are irrelevant. Please. Just do not limit yourself. Know what you're going for and um, you're going to do just fine. Okay, um, thank you. Next up, Mr. Shitsu, your closing remarks, please. Hello? Mr. Shitsu, are you are you on? Um, I don't think Mr. Shitsu is on for now. So let's move on to Mr. Sule. Mr. Sule, please your closing remarks. I think basically it's just plan. Start planning now. Don't wait till you graduate from school before you start making preparations for your graduate studies. Just start planning now. Set your goals, know the requirements. What, which schools are you looking at? What are the requirements needed to get into these schools? What do you need to scale through? Just start planning now, and I believe you are, just, you are going to do well. Just start planning. All right, great, thank you. Next up, Mr. Judah, please your remarks. Yeah, man, what I'll say is like, know what you want, design your strategy as regards eating your target and just shoot all your shots. I mean, there are so many opportunities out there. So just just shoot, shoot, and then hopefully one of them gets in. I mean, you can only go to one school if you are going for graduate school. So if, irrespective of how many uh, offers you get, you can only go to one. So just try as much as you can. All right, thank you. And finally, Mr. MG, um, please, your closing remarks. Um, so I'll say this again. Um, the one sure way to not get into any school is to not apply, right? So if you're in this school and you're considering graduate study, because see, I made the decision to apply to Stanford in an elevator, right? An elevator in Senate building, talking to a current Stanford student, right? So if you're contemplating graduate study, give it a shot, right? Just apply, regardless of what the admission rate is, regardless of how much it's gonna cost, regardless of order, apply. And if you're interested at all, you might as well apply to the top school, right? Apply to several schools, but I am I'm biased towards top schools. Like they will fund everything. Right? So just, just apply for sure. Apply. Um, and I think you'd have a great time. Grad school is stressful, but it's extremely rewarding. So yeah, apply. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Michael Jacob, Ms. Kotha, Babatunde, Mr. Judah Odeachi, Mr. Ahmed Sule. And Mr. Ab Hafiz Shitsu, you've been fantastic speakers today. So I've been Chigoze and I've been the moderator for this session. I'll be handing over to our president, Mr. Tosi Akinde Peters, to conclude. Thank you guys and have a great rest of the evening. Uh, thank, thank you, you Chigoze, Chigoze. For, for, for the lovely moderation, in fact. I believe this session was a massive success. Uh, it's quite unfortunate that we have to come to an end. We may have to plan another session sometime in the future, but we, we don't know what, what will happen. But then today's session was a massive success. I'd like to thank our speakers. Uh, uh, they have sacrificed a lot. I know, I know in MJ's place, it's probably 8 in the morning now. And in Carter's place, it's, it's probably 8 in the evening. So... Our, our speakers have sacrificed a lot and they have given uh, their insights, they have um, educated us and they have prepared us for postgraduate studies in its, in its common sense. And I also like to thank everyone of us that have joined us today. Uh, this session would have been possible without you. I also like to thank uh, the planning committee, the executives of University of Lagos SP student chapter. And on behalf of all of us, I say a big thank you for joining us. I say a big thank you for being a speaker today. I do believe that we'll meet at the top. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. So, let me add that at Carter's place, it's past 11 p.m. Past this program 11. started at 9 p.m. her time. 
And thank you so much, Carter, for coming through. At Judas Place, this program started at 8 a.m. It's about past 10 a.m. at Judas End. Um, Ahmed and uh, Mafiz is about four, past 4 p.m. Uh, on my end, this program started at 6 a.m. and it's past 8 a.m. now. Um, so thank you. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. I hope that it's been worth your time. I mean, we took over two hours of your time, and I hope that you at least got something from it. Um, feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn. Um, if you're going to connect on LinkedIn, please include a note with your request. It's easy. It helps start the conversation, and you just come across as more serious when you do that. Um, Feel free to ask questions, look into the requirements for the schools you're applying to. And please, 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 please. If there's any reason why you don't go to grad school, let it not be because you do not apply. All right, so just, just apply. Wow. Okay, thank you. Thank you guys for your sacrifice and your time. And we appreciate everything from our end. Thank you. By the way, this is the grad student here. Despite <laughs> <my> TV. <laughs>